So I'm here at the headquarters of Echo in Fort Myer, Florida, and I'm here with Elliot. Tell us a little bit about Echo. Yeah, well, Echo is a Christian nonprofit that seeks to honor God by empowering smallholder farmers to be able to feed their families. One of the things that we like to say is we, we try to honor farmers' knowledge and seeing that they each have something to contribute. And one of those things um, I think that uh, goes along not just with growing plants but is appropriate technology and that's where I fit in. It's looking for technologies or techniques that are sustainable for the environment, sustainable for the farmer economically, and they're culturally appropriate. So this area of the tour is mostly dedicated to turning your crop from raw product in the field coming to market. So we have somewhat of a simulation of a market here. Just because we can grow something, if we can't bring it to market or turn it into something that we can eat, then we're still going hungry. So we have to make sure we have good ways to process all of our product. So whether that be grains and beans and pulses or oils like this oil expeller there, most of these things are very simple machines that you can make yourself. The technologies that we use the most on the farm have to do with processing grains and other seeds. So here's a good example from the Philippines, a treadle powered thresher. So you've just got this pedal here and we can move this back and forth to build up some speed. And then I'll take my sheaths of rice and set them here. Those tines hit the, the heads of, of rice and knock the rice grains off the stalk. So my initial threshing can be done this way versus a tr more traditional way would be pounding them on the ground or, or using a mortar and pestle um, or some sort of threshing board or flail. Uh, a lot of a lot of energy dedicated to threshing. So this can reduce that amount of work. So after we'd thresh it and we'd run it through a sieve initially just to get the larger stalks out. And then for rice in particular, it would go into a mill. So this rice mill is a small scale rice mill, something that uh, smallholder farmers might be able to buy together and it can move enough volume that they could process their crop. Maybe not as efficient as the larger rice mills, but still made with simple components that they could repair and maintain on their own. So this burr grinder, again, fairly simple technology, but something that can really change the way that you can sell your crop by being able to add value. Maybe instead of selling raw peanuts, now I can sell peanut butter. Or instead of just selling whole corn, whole kernel corn, I can sell cornmeal. So simple sort of mills like this can, can really change the way somebody lives. One of the other things that we use quite a bit here uh, just to clean our, our seeds is a vacuum winnower. So this is a pretty simple idea. It takes a little bit to build. You need to build these little triangular blocks and this whole area you can just build all out of wood. Basically you've got your seed that come in uh, that start here in the hopper and we can control how much seed come out with this this gate here and then we have a vacuum that's attached to the top here like so. And this vacuum, it's gonna draw air through, depending on how much pressure I want coming through here, how much draw I want uh, coming through here. If I open this gate higher, more air will be sucked in from here rather than from this channel. And so what's gonna happen is I can, I can adjust this um, intake and adjust uh, my throughput by, by opening and closing the, the gate. And the seeds are gonna start to fall through and they're gonna hit and just go zigzag back and forth. Well, there's air coming up the opposite way. So the air is going to suck or carry the chaff away and the seed being heavier than the chaff, it's gonna drop down through. As it gets to the bottom, you should have the seeds coming out here and, and then you'll have the chaff getting stuck in here. Well, this is the seed bank, seed barn, where we process seeds and store different seeds. One of the uh, challenges, especially as a smallholder farmer, is after you have a crop, how do you store seeds uh, reliably so you can use them for the next year or several years down the road? That can be a big challenge, 
especially in places where we don't have air conditioning, climate control, and where pests can be difficult to manage. Um, they might not have a real cold season, like a winter, to kill off a lot of pests. Before storing anything, what kind of moisture content is our seed? If we store the seed too wet, it's going to mold and it can render it useless for us. So in order to make sure our crop is stored well, we got to make sure it's dry enough. So this is just called a salt test. Basically, we use dry table salt. We'll put it in a jar and put the seed in there. We'll put a couple of tablespoons of salt. And as long as the salt is just freely flowing, not clumping together, not sticking to whatever seed it is, and not sticking to the edges of the jar, we know roughly we're in the neighborhood for being dry enough to store. As we then move into storage, there are a few different options that, that we um, tend to promote. One of them for small lots of seed is vacuum sealing. Hermetic storage is by far the most effective way that we can, we can keep our, our seeds. But say I have a small batch of seeds that I, I want to to keep air tight. As long as I have a lid with some sort of gasket on it, like this jar, I can uh, put a hole in the top of the lid and then I'll take a little piece of tape and I'll just loosely put it on there. I'm not going to press it on there right now. And I can take a, this is just an inner tube um, to act as a seal for me. And this is just a bike pump that we've taken the bottom check valve out of. If you can find one that you can take apart and you can reverse the valve. But if we reverse it, we then will be drawing air out rather than pushing air in. And so I'll just set this on my, on my uh, gasket there. And pretty soon it'll get really hard to pump. And then I'll make sure my tape is good and sealed. The vacuum that I've drawn in there now is going to keep that lid on and it'll stay sealed. Now, once it's hermetically sealed like this, I've now reduced the issue of storing in high humidity. Storing seeds in high humidity is not good for a variety of reasons. One of them would be the potential for mold and fungus growth. The other piece of it is using a vacuum to draw out that available oxygen. I've reduced the, the oxygen level in, in the container Ideally, this container would be filled completely full so I have as little airspace as possible. Um, and this way, if there are pests in that jar, they won't have enough oxygen to be completing their life cycle. So they'll die off fairly quickly. That's a pretty good, pretty good seal. And you can just pull the piece of tape off and do it again. Even just having jars, you know, larger mason jars or anything that has a good seal on it, um, you could you can use these for the kitchen. You want to keep your coffee beans fresh. You know, you open the bag, you can put them in there, suck the air out, and you've got fresh beans um, for the next use. It, it can keep all sorts of dry goods, store them better as well, keep them fresh. We, we try to advocate for conservation ag principles, so minimum tillage, minimum soil disturbance. If we're disturbing the soil layer, it's just the first couple inches of, of soil. But some of the challenges that come with that is how do you plant into a lot of crop residue? How do you manage weeds? So we've got some tools that are just hand powered, whether that be a wheel hoe. These are really nice. This is from actually a company in Georgia, I believe, Haas. As long as your row is, is wide enough, you can, just, you can just kind of work it back and forth like this as you're going. And as long as you get the weeds when they're fairly young, I mean, you can just walk down each row and it, it takes them out very easily. The nice thing about this is that you can also adapt it. They have some planters, little push planters and stuff, so you can use the same setup for the handles and all that to use it to power your plant, to push your planter. The other push planters that we use um, are typically jab planters. So this is one way to get around having a lot of crop residue. Having a, a jab planter push through that residue um, rather than trying to push some sort of shank or something through the, the ground. As you're pushing it in the ground and it activates a seed meter that, that drops the seed into each of the, into one of those beaks. The other one is for fertilizer if you want to use fertilizer. You can just do that over and over again. So this one is a little bit faster, but uh, there are some limitations of you know, getting it into the ground um, far enough depending on what, what seed you're using. 
Works on the same principle as a jab planter, but it's just rolling. So you just move it forward like this, and it'll, it'll release a seed and drop that seed in every time it punches a hole. So if you're planting a larger area by hand, um, these can be really useful. Tell us a little bit about Echo and what their, their whole like goal and plan is. We act as basically a, a catalyst, I think, in, in a network of development workers, practitioners, people that are working with smallholder farmers um, to share knowledge, to be verifying claims. People say, hey, this is working well. We say, okay, let's try it and see if it really does work. And then disseminate that to the network of people that read Echo's publications. One of the things that we like to say is we, we try to honor farmers' knowledge and seeing that they each have something to contribute. And one of those things um, I think that uh, goes along not just with growing plants, but is appropriate technology. And that's where I fit in, is looking for technologies or techniques that are um, sustainable for the environment, sustainable for the farmer economically, um, and they're culturally appropriate. They are usually locally sourced and available um, where they are working. They're able to maintain them and use them long term. How do you guys afford to do this educational work? So we are a nonprofit. Um, we're funded mostly by individual donors. People like you and me who have a heart to make a difference in the world. We want to um, be able to contribute to good work that's going to be a long-term solution to keep people from going hungry. And then also we have a demonstration farm here, so we have public tours. We generate some revenue from the, from the tours, but then also from the nursery and bookstore and seeds. But by far the majority comes from individual donations. So speaking of the individual donations, there is a link in the description below. As you're watching this video, if you like what you see and you want to help support this company, which I highly recommend, check out that link and you can do so. Hopefully you liked that video. If you did, make sure you give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, don't miss any of the wonderful videos that we have coming, including part four of this series. If this has uh, already been posted for a little bit, part four will be popping up right now, so you can check that out. Don't forget, Echo is a nonprofit organization, and if you want, you can donate in the link description below. We only got to see a small section of that part of this tour, what you can learn from this section. If you get a chance and you're in Fort Myer, Florida, or the surrounding area, I highly recommend to go and get a tour at the farm. It doesn't cost very much, and it is a eye-opening experience, so do that if you can. We'll see you in one of these other videos.